Hi, I'm Sarah Cowgill, along with Andrew Moran, Dave Patterson, John Clark, and Tim Donner. And this is the Conservative Five Liberty Nation's online TV news program. President Biden appeared to take a strong stand against Iran as the hostile Mideast nation was threatening retaliation. But when the dust settled, he changed his mind on joining forces with Israel and advised them not to strike back. America's chief executive told Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that the Jewish nation, having just escaped a catastrophic onslaught of 170 attack drones, 30 cruise missiles, and 110 ballistic missiles, should take it as a win and not retaliate. So, hey, Israel, walk it off. Is that what we're hearing from the leader of the free world? It's an election year with a few months to go. What is the Biden strategy, Tim? Well, best I can tell, Sarah, there is no strategy except to lurch back and forth based on the most recent demand of the extremists in his party. He said he would he would be unwavering. That's the word he used in his support of Israel. And then he immediately began to waver. And so he has infuriated both sides uh, in this because he can't take a position and stick with it. And I tell you what, that is what the hostile anti-American forces are mortal enemies in the world were counting on. They were counting on the almost certainty that Joe Biden would start to back down once he got political pressure, which he did from his left, from his extreme left, from the media, and from his own party. And so, best I can tell, um, he has no strategy other than to respond to the latest um, actions such as, I mean, when these left-wing extremists, these radicals started shutting down highways and airports and major arteries in big cities, it's really remarkable that they thought that that would convince the people whose lives were disrupted, whose days were ruined, uh, about the righteousness of their cause. Imagine being on the Golden Gate Bridge and you're stalled for five hours and you say, well, you know what? I guess they really have a point. <laughs> I don't think so. So this is, it's a quagmire. And it's why I've said that I think that uh, Israel and the broader war in the Middle East could be the Waterloo for Joe Biden because he has lost control or more accurately ceded control with his weakness and vacillation and neither side trusts him and he has scorned Benjamin Netanyahu and the mullahs in Iran are likely sitting around making jokes about the doctrine of don't. <laughs> the doctrine of don't. <laughs> the doctrine I love the alliteration. I love the alliteration. Oh, I just that was classic. That was classic. Uh, Andrew, you don't live yes. here, and um, but you do have <laughs> kind of a clear insight into what goes on in other, you know, nations. I mean, you're you're tuned in. Do world leaders see the U.S. as a bunch of patsies, or weak, or strong, or? We used to be the big dog in the yard. What happened? Well, first, I will say that I live rent free in Sarah's head. I'll say that. But it's but but I think the best way to answer this question is by quoting Robert Hur, sympathetic, well-meaning, elderly man with a poor memory. You know, geopolitical strife has been nothing new. It happened under Trump, but the but everything that's happened in the last couple of years under the current administration, Russia invading Ukraine, uh, the attacks on Israel, a potential invasion of Taiwan, it's all been quite revealing because they see a guy who can barely string together two sentences. Why would they be afraid of a man who is unpopular at home, trying to seek re-election at a time when inflation is ravaging the country and price pressures are being revived? You know, 
it's probably that you know the the global uh, uh, global adversaries of America laughed at Trump, but they probably could not predict him because he was so erratic. He'd go on X and say, you know, hey, Rocket Man, I have bigger rockets than you do. I can fire them at any time. You know, <laughs> Vladimir Putin. He was on. He was he was interviewed a couple of months ago. And he was saying how he would prefer Biden than Trump because uh, Biden is more predictable. And of course, he's a standard politician. You know, he just follows, you know, the the the, the military industrial complex and the neocons and all the, the, the pro-war members of the Democratic Party. So it's understandable what would happen. But overall, I'm it, it's guaranteed that the, the country's adversaries and probably even the U.S. allies see Joe Biden as a joke who can, you know, who can barely walk and he wakes up late with the with the pap mask on. On his with the pap uh, marks <laughs> on his face, you know, so. mask. Yeah, he got yes, he got face face wrinkles. Yes. He got face wrinkles, but yes. not his wrinkles. <laughs> you know, John. Um, I know that you went to a um, Kennedy event and met um, RFK Jr. And this year, Americans are faced with a big decision, and I'm wondering if Kennedy is going to be a third party you know, come around to being more than just a guy who's going to poke holes in uh, the two we got running. The way they attack him by the Democrats certainly shows what they think of him. So I guess they won't be propping him up in place of Joe Biden because they're desperately looking, I hear, for another candidate before it's too late. I think it's already too late. I think a lot of people, interestingly, Democrats... How the heck are you going to get rid of the guy? You can't get, just get rid of the guy. You can't just go step down. He is the president. And he's already declared and he's wants to finish the job. Sorry to interrupt. But I, I mean, how do you just get rid of the guy? Well, so you can't and you certainly can't run Kamala because she has achieved the amazing stellar accomplishment of being even more unpopular and more inept. She probably could have handled Afghanistan better uh, because that's also part of this legacy. Thomas Friedman pointed out in his book from Beirut to Jerusalem that the um, Arab culture is one where you do not want to show weakness. And Joe Biden is weak on everything. In fact, I, I think I just read this morning, he's tripled steel tariffs against China to appease union workers here. And he's mad at China for subsidizing renewables while he subsidizes renewables. I mean, this, this administration from the border to the economy to inflation is just one series of lies and ineptitudes. It's rather horrifying. But I think a lot of Americans, in answer to your question, Democrats are afraid to switch their votes uh, to a uh, RFK because they're worried they'll put Trump in. And Trump supporters are averse to switching their votes to RFK, even if they like him, because they're afraid they might put Biden in. But Tim, you're wrong. I mean, clearly gluing oneself to Rembrandt's and closing down airports has got, got people wanting to get rid of oil. And so more protests, I mean, I'm being um, ironic there. No, it doesn't work, but who can appease these two sides in the Israel conflict? So I don't know where RFK lands in this, but I do believe that he is adding a voice that's much needed, particularly amongst the Democrat side, because the Democrats, Democrats have the big schism now between their far left and the blue dog traditional Democrats. Sorry well, I, you know, I don't I don't get why they don't pick a side. They like like Tim said earlier, they you know, there's a an old adage that you can't be everything to everyone. So pick a side, pick the side that's going to vote for you. I mean, the Jewish people have never really been in love with any Republican candidate. And, and I haven't figured that out yet, but there is a, there is a, there is a movement to walk away. He won't do it because he's a coward. Joe Biden is not only weak, he's a coward. He cannot take the pressure um, that comes from him internationally. I mean, look, the moment that Trump left office, I won't say the moment, but within weeks or at most months after Donald Trump vacated the White House, Putin started lining his troops along the Ukrainian border. Mm -hmm. And so Joe Biden promptly says, well, if it's just a minor incursion, we won't do anything, which is an unambiguous message that he's not going to do anything at all. And then in the Israeli conflict, it's pretty clear that the America's stated enemies, their mortal enemies, the people that want to wipe America off the map, you know, 
those people were able to count on Joe Biden doing what they could never count on Donald Trump doing. So when Donald Trump was president, there was peace and prosperity. Those are still the fundamentals of an election. And right. when Joe Biden can claim to have produced neither peace nor prosperity, actually, he's produced the opposite in both cases. Well, I and you are 100% correct, but here's what bothers me a little bit. And Dave, I, I know you can answer this, but when, US is a, when the U.S. is at war, they don't like to change presidents. So will Trump rise or take a hit over the Middle East conflict? Well, I think it's a lot more complicated than that, as we've seen over the course of history. And if you look at recent history, you know, it doesn't appear to be the case. The, uh, the notion got started, I think, under uh, FDR in that era of World War II. But more recently, administrations have changed because of other factors. And you can just look uh, in the midst of the Iranian crisis during Jimmy Carter's administration, the American people dumped him because he was inept at solving the crisis. And I think that you can look at the American people to see Joe Biden in the same way. Uh, the defining factor in whether, you know, the American people keep a uh, president in office, you know, during a war crisis is just basically determined by the voters' perception of how that president is handling the crisis. And we know for a fact that Joe Biden is totally inept at handling crisis. You don't have to look very far. He, he wasn't in office nine months and he stumbled, bumbled and fumbled over his way through the Afghan withdrawal. Every he, as John so rightly explained, you know, it wasn't very long after he took office that uh, Putin decides that he's going to put uh, uh, troops on the border with Ukraine, and it's because the perception of ineptitude and and weakness is one in which. It may be the only thing that the Biden administration excels in. And, uh, you know, it's it's going to be that as as the dynamic that uh, persuades the tide of voter opinion against the incumbent. And using that metric, Biden is in trouble. I would add, though, if you look at the exit polls and the primaries on, on both sides of the aisle, for Republicans, foreign policy is not a top issue. It still remains economy and immigration. For the Democrats, foreign policy, again, is not a top issue. It's abortion and, and transgenderism. Well, it's become a top issue now through, through no desire of theirs. And, and Andrew, I, I think that, that you narrow the focus or you broaden the focus uh, to foreign policy, which is pretty nebulous. But if you ask people, how is Biden handling the Middle East, it, the, the uh, results are totally different. Well, and the polls are reflecting that the reality that Republicans are just standing aside and letting the Democrats destroy themselves on foreign policy in Ukraine and particularly, of course, Israel and the war against Hamas. Um, they Republicans aren't hit at all on foreign policy. As a matter of fact, the contrast between the peace, the no new foreign wars, the no Putin excursions into foreign lands to try and take over Georgia or Crimea or now Ukraine, none of that, none of that happened during the Trump years. So in fact, the contrast is so striking between the two presidents, foreign policy records that I think it's going to be for sure a contributing factor, just as in 1980, stagflation may have crushed Jimmy Carter, but his response to the Iran hostage taking stacked on top of it caused Jimmy Carter to lose 45 states as an incumbent. That rarely, if ever, happens. The only time right. it happened other than that was with Herbert Hoover. Yeah. And that was the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And well, good point. This current president is on the global hunt for support of a diplomatic solution. Wherever will that lead? We'll keep you in the loop. Thanks, panel. Well, that's it for our Conservative Five panel today. 
Check out our other C5 shows and segments on your favorite video platform, YouTube, Vimeo, Rumble, we're on them all. As well, Liberty Nation has its own Roku channel where you can see all of our TV productions. I'm your host, Sarah Cowgill. Thanks for joining us today for free thinking, free speech, libertynation.com.